I hope everyone enjoyed the film as much as we did. Screen Times is thrilled to be welcoming longtime friends and collaborators, Academy Award winning screenwriter, director, and producer Sofia Coppola, and award winning actor and, and director Kirsten Dunst. The duo will discuss their most recent, recent project, The Beguiled, which you just watched, their creative process, behind the scenes stories, and what it's like to work together for almost 20 years. Moderating the conversation and all screen time events is veteran New York Times contributing writer Logan Hill. Please join me in giving a very warm welcome to Logan Hill, Sophia Coppola, and Kirsten Dunst. Sure. Hello. Thanks for Hi, coming. Hi, everyone. Thank you. Yeah, really thank you for coming. Uh, yeah, I, don't, I don't know if you two know, this is our first Screen Times event we've done. We've been doing Times Talks for a long time. I've had the pleasure of hosting a bunch. Um, but we were so thrilled to find out we could get a great film like this and one of the world's best filmmakers and world's best actresses to help us kick it off. So thank you. Really thank you. It. That's really sweet. Thank you. I, and I think like when you when you kick something off new, you're always afraid nobody's going to come. So thank you for coming. We really Thanks appreciate it. Thanks for coming, guys. <laughs> always that, that worry at the last minute. Um, and we want to thank everybody watching on Facebook Live. Um, we have had uh, great audiences. And we're going to take a few questions from our Facebook Live audience. So leave them in the comments. Um, it will make up and in some small degree for the fact that you're the folks that didn't see the film tonight, unlike everybody here. Um, so thanks. Um, Let's, uh, you know, you were just saying you're getting a little verklempt backstage. Yeah, I well, was. The, tw the two decades that you two have been working together. Well, when they say 20 years, I know, it's, I, I, it's hard to we're believe. We're not that old to me. Maybe we're just our own. We were 16 when I met you. It was. You. And it's hard to believe. Yeah, I can't believe we've been working that long. Or you've been working longer, but. Yeah. I mean, it, I, f I feel like she must always be in your mind as an actress you want to work with. Or when a script like this comes together, are you seeing her in the part in the early stages? Yeah, that's the first thing I thought when I thought about doing this story. I thought, and Kirsten can play the teacher. And, um, and yeah, Kirsten's like my blonde alter ego. <laughs> <laughs> what, do you, what do you think? What do you, you think from your perspective? What do you think she saw in you when you were 16? I, I'm not sure. I think part of it was the fact, listen, I came with my mom when I first met Sophia, and I was 16, and I was pretty innocent. And I don't know, I think Sophia saw that I was... She has a good intuition about people, and I think she thought I was like, even though I was an actress, I was very normal, I would say. Right? Like a normal 16-year-old girl as a person. Oh. No? Yeah, but you had something else. I think. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, well. I, I don't no, know. I think what strikes, struck me about you when you were a kid is that, well, also I saw an interview with a vampire where you had this, you know, very wise look behind your eyes. But then also when I met you, you were con it's, it's weird to talk about someone to their it's face, like, but, I, anyway. <laughs> but she has a, a, a contrast of kind of a bubbly, extroverted blonde, but then something deeper and thoughtful, which kind of contrasts each other and, um, and has, has depth. And I thought when I was casting for Lux that she had something wiser and more deep and thoughtful behind her eyes that contrasted with, you know, kind of her personality. And I still, I still think that. Yeah. What do you think is different working, about working with Sophia now? Is she a different filmmaker on set than she used to be? Her, the like essential thing is not different to me. It's just now that, like, you know, you get older and you just have more confidence what you do, I think. So that's mm -hmm. the only thing I would say is that you just, yeah, are more assertive in what your choices are and you know, when you make your first movie, I, w I would be <laughs> a nervous wreck. And I remember you being <laughs> nervous too and not eating a lot. Like I, you know, I was young too. We were both young together, but I just, I think now, now, you know, we're just older and that, that confidence just comes with age, you know, like anybody, any person in any job. And you know, some filmmakers that you kind of make the same movie over and over and over again, you're not one of those filmmakers. Uh, this That's film. nice to hear, because sometimes I feel like I'm doing the same thing over yeah. and over. Did you ever Are feel you? like that with this film? 
No, I, what I liked about this movie is it reminded me parts of it of Virgin Suicide, so I felt like I was revisiting something I was connected to, but then doing it in a different way. Or It didn't feel like it was retreading the same territory, but it felt related, and then taking whatever I liked about that and and going further with it, and that the, that the girl, the women are different ages, and it's not, um, but there was definitely a connection. Mm-hmm. But I do get a lot of like, why are these people stuck and isolated, and why are they in fancy hotels? And you know, <laughs> I felt like, but I think a lot of artists and creative people, they, they, you're always trying to figure out whatever it is you're trying to figure out, and you keep looking at that, and you know, why does Bruce Weber always shoot dogs and right. romantic guys, or you know, lots of people do that. So, yeah. Yeah, well, I know you've you've uh, adapted. Um, material from different sources before, but never really a, a film that, yeah, I know this, there's a novel as well that preceded the 1971 film starring Clint Eastwood, um, but did it feel different knowing that there was another film out there that you're sort of working in relation to? Yeah, I, I knew about the Beguiled from the movie, and I, so then I, when I started thinking about how I would make a film from the women character's point of view, I tried to forget the Don Siegel movie and just approach it in a new way and I, I got the book and just started looking at how I would do it as a film and I tried to forget how they did it yeah. um, but it was it was a challenge for me it was different in that it was a, kind of in a genre and so how to really embrace southern gothic genre but in my own way mm-hmm. what was your first impression of the film well, I thought it was weird that Clint Eastwood kisses a six-year-old <laughs> within like the second <laughs> scene you know what I mean yeah. it, 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 it def- definitely had that you know, Roman Polanski, like, you know, anything goes 70s vibe. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know no. what I mean? Uh, I think Sophia, you know, told this film from a very different perspective and uh, from the woman's perspective. And Colin Far- Farrell's very charming. And she let him keep his Irish accent, which is from the, the original novel. He was Irish. So I think that helped make his manipulation more palatable. Uh, yeah, I, I thought it was so interesting the way his character is reframed because in the original, he, he's just sort of a blunt force in that movie with amazing hair, <laughs> you know? Oh, yes, I forgot about that. <laughs> Eastwood's hair is something, that, it's like its own special effect. Uh, <laughs> but but in, uh, maybe it's just I think about this. Yeah, you're right. Like, I was going to say. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's true because I just saw it the other day and it, it is. Uh, but this I almost thought of Colin Farrell as like that guy on OkCupid who sets up like five different profiles to attract like five different women. <laughs> he's like the sensitive gardener. He's the guy who loves adventure. He's like the, the gentleman, you know. Uh, he plays the, sort of the fan. Of, he kind of reads these women very early on, it seems like. Yeah, definitely. I thought, I mean, I thought, yeah, who's this guy going to be that can handle all these women? And he... I mean, Colin is very charming and charismatic, but I, I knew that character had to relate to each of them in a different way, and, and, and he was good at being able to do that. Mm-hmm. And, and the Clint, I mean, the Don Siegel version, it's, he's more clear-cut as a bad guy, and I wanted to be in the women's point of view, especially her character, to kind of try to you know, hope along with her and try to figure him out, and it seemed more interesting. Yeah, because in, in the original, there are flashbacks repeated and you know immediately that you know, he's a liar, that he was burning. He says, oh, I love the farms. Everything's gorgeous here. And you see shots of him burning down the farms or murdering people. Yeah. Um, how, do, how does that change the way Edwina sees him in this version versus the 1971 version? To be honest, when you were explaining that, I was like, I forgot that. I forgot that. I forgot <laughs> that. Because I watched it a while ago. Because mm-hmm. Sophia gay, you know, came to me with the idea before, I think before you wrote the script, right? Yeah, 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 I think really early on. And I watched the movie, and then I kind of forgot about it after that. So for me, Edwina was my own thing, and how to make you know, her inner turmoil, that bubbling thing that's just like so much repression and so much anger and rage, and make that you know, something to watch as like slowly burning until the end. She's so pent up. Is it tough when so you play a character that's, that can't show too much externally like that? No, I always thought like I'd be better in the silent era. <laughs> 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 better without, I, feel, I always feel like I, like I like watching actors. I like the private moments in movies always the most. Mm-hmm. 
I feel like I could, I could see the audience tonight. I watched the first ha hour of the film here, and you could see people realizing it was OK to laugh a little bit here and there. Yeah, I'm so glad. It's so fun to watch it with the audience that laughs. And, and I'm so glad when they're feel OK to laugh at it, because it's, um, yeah, I think that, that was part of the fun of it, is that it's, um, there's, I think it's fun. Hopefully, it's funny. All right, when we were in the edit, we were cracking up, and mm -hmm. then you know, to, how to have the humor, but without going into full camp, to still be emotionally connected. And I think Kirsten's character, I think, is so touching, and so that was always a balance of that, you know, between the humor and the emotional connection. And how, what mix of that are you finding on set versus finding in the edit? When you're saying, well, that that plays that scene, that shot, particular shot, plays too broad or too campy. Oh, that's a good question. I think when we were shooting, there were a few like around the dinner scene where we were getting really delirious and it was getting kind of over the top. And then, you know, in the edit room, you balance it. But I think I think we were all clear on the tone, and it was it's a very kind of subtle uh, humor. It's all under under the surface and kind of brimming. So I think everyone got what the um, the tone was, and then um, so it was pretty pretty clear. And you know, and then in the edit, you're kind of how long can you stay on that glance or whatever. Mm -hmm. Was it tricky sometimes just hold like understanding that the situation is so comic at some points that the, the the lust is so obvious in the room but nobody feels like they can show that did that get just tough to hold to take? No, because I took Edwina very seriously. Mm -hmm. So for me, I never the only times I would like laugh or we'd be having too good of a time was kind of around like the apple pie scene and doing those things that were clearly like, you know, looks to each other. But Edwina, I think when she goes in that room towards the end, she doesn't know what she's going to do. You know, she kind of wants to calm him for the girls. And you know, she's clearly unexperienced and she's desperate for so many reasons. And it's not because it's him. It's because she is stuck in this house. So mm -hmm. I, I didn't, f I never played a scene like with a wink, wink, like this yeah. could be funny ever. You know, I think all the characters were really, took their characters seriously and were really in it and emotional. And, and so that's why we could have some humor, but it always hopefully felt real because they were so into it. Yeah. I mean, one thing that felt really real, more, much more real to me in this version than the original was just the, the attraction, the basic level of attraction between each of the women and Colin Farrell. You know, that there's something like so deviant about the setup of the, the old one where the headmistress is and an incestuous relationship yeah, really with, her, with her brother. Yeah, with her brother. Right and now. then with Edwina, too. There's like a weird thing happening, too. Yeah. There's like a weird yeah, fantasy sequence. It's, it, yeah. it's weird that, yeah, there's definitely other stuff going on. I just tried to forget all about that and just go to the book and, and focus on the characters I wanted to. And, and also the idea that, that their desire could be something that's human and natural and not like a perverted, weird thing, mm -hmm. you know? So that was a big part of it. Yeah, it did feel to me like they each had very like relatable reasons for for seeing what they wanted to see in this man. It was either an escape or an example of what anybody would like in a relationship, right? Yeah, yeah I tried to make it in a way that was yeah I felt human, and each one is different, and 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 the idea that they're really cut off from the world and how isolated they were, and there's no they haven't seen a man in years, and then an enemy soldier comes upon them. Yeah, we talk about shifting this from the sort of very male perspective of. The first one, and, and I don't know, do, you, do you mean the book as well? Do you think the book is sort of told from a much more masculine per perspective than, than the, your film? The book technically is, is it was written by a man in the 60s, and it's kind of a pulpy book, but it's um, each chapter is a different, it's only the female characters telling the story, so it's technically from their point of view. But I, um, yeah, I just kind of looked at it to find which characters and more backstory, and then I really, you know, uh, ma and imagined a lot of it too. You've talked about um, objectifying Colin Farrell, having fun with that in the film. That that you know that, that that's a part of the attraction of this film. That's part of the reason he's attractive to these women. Talk a little bit about how you shot Colin and how you worked with him. He was a really good sport. He knew that he was our. He knew he was the object. And when we were doing the gardening scenes, we were like shooting a calendar at the same time. And he, <laughs> I know I did Seth Meyers tonight. And they're like, he was like, I want the Colin Fallon calendar. Colin Fallon, Colin Farrell. I did Fallon Friday. That's why I was like. Farrell calendar. Yeah, Colin Farrell calendar. Yeah, I, um, I asked Philippe, the DP, 
where those photos are, and I'm, I'm going to work on the calendar. Okay, so. good. If anyone's <laughs> interested, the Colin Phil calendar is on the way. So wait, you were you were literally shooting photo like shooting sort of romance novel cover style. It just looks so much like a romance novel when he's like sawing the log, and he and he he played it up, and we had like he's like sweating and roses are blooming around him. So <laughs> we. Um, he totally indulged us, and we got into it, and and then Philippe, the DP, was taking stills um, for me as we were doing that, because we, yeah, we thought, oh, we have to do the calendar. Yeah, so is, is the calendar going to exist? It seems like there's, like, interest in, in this calendar. Not, yeah, I asked him to find them. I don't know if we have enough for 12 months, but we're going to work on it. <laughs> Bring them back for reshoots. Yeah. Yeah. Do you, um, you know, and that reminds me, I saw recently you were on stage with John Waters, uh, talking to him about the film. Um, sorry, you're with me tonight. Um, he said, uh, you know, it has everything, this film. It has handsome men, repressed sex, violence, everything I yearned for as a child. Uh, He's the best. That's amazing. <laughs> um, I hope we can put that on our poster or an ad. <laughs> you're, that's such a smart idea, like John Waters said. Instead of quotes from magazines and things, you just have John Waters yeah. quotes. <laughs> Big, yeah. Yeah, and, and, I, and I saw another interview with my friend Kyle Buchanan over at, at Vulture, and you were saying, you know, you felt like in some ways this film was made for gay men and for women, that, that it was a different kind of intended audience. That's what I was thinking of. And like when we were casting Colin, I was thinking, like, I want a guy that women and gay men will both like. And that's my audience that we're going for here. Mm -hmm. I'm ready I, for the I, Halloween costumes. Yeah, so when, when, you would when, think about that on set, like, oh. When Nicole showed up as Miss Martha, I was like, I just want to see men as Miss Martha for Halloween. <laughs> Did, maybe can we get a poll? Did that work? Did like do our gay men and women in this audience? Did you, did you like feel in Colin? Yay! Thank you. <laughs> um, I like there. He's a different kind of dangerous in this film, too, than the original. There's something different about like the way he feels dangerous in this movie to me. Um, yeah, I don't. I don't know. I mean, I think Colin has a bad boy repu like history. Yes, we um, all know. I, well, yeah. I think we were. It's. <laughs> I don't know, I think we were doing a more nat naturalistic style probably than the, mm -hmm. the 70s one. It's really yeah. 70s, the other one. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I feel like the original, there's a lot of like California accents and uh, a lot of details that are missing. It seems like you've put a lot of care into the period details. Shot on film, oh, yeah. a lot of natural light, and it seems like from, would you talk a little bit about like just yeah, that visual approach? Yeah, it was important that it felt um, believable of of the period, even though that was you know, not the focus of it, but that you could forget about that and believe it. And for me, it was difficult with the dialogue to, when we would, to make it feel naturalistic that you could relate to, but then still believable from another era and not feel ye old in a, mm -hmm. in a way that you'd be aware of. Um, but I wanted it to feel authentic to the period with the costumes and the way we had etiquette teachers and dance teachers and teaching them how to you know, how they would hold their skirts or all those kind of details so that you could believe it was that period. And, and um, of course, the Don Siegel movie is very 70s, with like Zooms, and, mm -hmm. and that it has its own charm. But, but we were, you know, trying to, to not be aware of the period but have it feel authentic. Yeah. I think I was watching again, and I realized that you know, early in the, the film, there's a grammar lesson, a French lesson, and they're saying, you know, I am a girl, we are girls together. And the girls behave very differently, whether they're sort of alone with him or on their own or in a group together. Is that part of the idea of, of exploring how the dynamic changes? Yeah, I think just the idea of a group of women together, the idea of like bo girls boarding school is always you know, kind of glamorous to me. And the idea that there are all these women of different ages all living together, cut off from the world, and no men around, and then what happens when a man comes in. And I think it, it does change when there's a group of women and then a man comes in, and you know, I just you see that. And also, I was interested in the just the dynamics between the women and the hierarchy and how they communicate. I feel like women can communicate in a in a very nonverbal way. With you know, they say a lot with a glance or their tone or gesture. So I just I, I'm fascinated by that, and I thought it was fun to explore that. Yeah. Edwina's place in that hierarchy is really interesting because the, she's clearly dominated by this headmistress or in relationship. Very much so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that poor little Edwina. Yeah. <laughs> Kirsten would like turn into Edwina, we'd be like at lunch and she'd be laughing and talking and then she'd put her costume back on and turn into Edwina and it was always a big, 
uh, you could just go right into another person. The one thing I re- someone said to me was like, I didn't see your dimple the entire movie. I was like, oh, I did a good job. I was like, that was the one thing I liked that someone commented that like, <laughs> I never smiled more than. That. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna yeah. Well, I have another question about Colin in that I've, I've talked to a few female directors who have made films that are very like driven by female stories. And they've said they've really had trouble getting male stars to work with them. The, the, the casting process has been more difficult because guys are, you know, women, major female stars are used to being the girlfriend, the wife, and a lot of major male stars, you know, just have a different kind of privilege to that sort of role. Um, have you encountered that either in this film or other films of yours? I mean, it makes sense, but I haven't. I mean, Colin was, I mean, he, he was. He takes a real man to let the women be in charge in this movie. So he was cool and he was up for it. Yeah. Um, I wonder how much uh, this film, you know, like was getting through the studio process. You said at some point that you had some notes that were practically your saving sort of for comic value. Oh, no, I shouldn't. I shouldn't say that. I said that to John Waters, and I forgot oh, yeah, that yeah. the rest of the world would hear. What was it like, bringing, like putting this script together? I mean, just in pitching it to people in the first place and saying, "Well, this, Uni- is this idea I've got." Universal owned the property from the original book from the Don Siegel film, so I I went to them and I asked if they would take it out of their archive and their library, and if they would let me reinterpret it. And um, and luckily, they said to talk to Focus, who's connected with them, and and they were open to the to the idea. So. Mm-hmm. So they were, um, yeah. So they let me do it, and um, and it was, you know, a low a low budget film, so not a huge risk for them. And we we went down to New Orleans and sh- and shot the film. Yeah, and Beyonce, I don't know what Beyonce, they thought that of mansion that. was in Lemonade, right? <laughs> yeah, she definitely didn't stay at the Hamptons Inn though. <laughs> she shot there. <laughs> I feel like we just got detention. We just got, I know. I Sorry, I got past some notes in class um, from our um, Facebook Live oh, viewers. Okay. I thought okay. it was like, Hi. try to like. I, know. I was like, what are these m- notes? Yeah, like, yeah. Try to, Stop talking so much, Logan, is the first one. <laughs> no. um, uh, first question, was the cinematography inspired by period painting? Um, it reminds me of Barry Lyndon. Oh, uh, Philippe Lassorde, our cinematographer, who's so great, we looked at a lot of, um, references of paintings and photography and and we really wanted to feel like the natural light of that time so it probably reminds me of Barry Landon because of all the candle light scenes mm-hmm. and um we did a lot of candle and film tests for different kinds there's different wick candles then so we there was a lot of thought and planning put in into how to make it look um hopefully real to that time mm-hmm. so how much artificial lighting ended up being used in the film um, I mean, there was some, but that's all Philippe's careful recipe. But we, we yeah. did have double with candles that make more light, so it looks like so you can really light that area with. And, and they had more candles than they would have had in reality because at that time they didn't have very much. Right. But we hope that the audience wouldn't notice that and went for the, the look. <laughs> <laughs> Another Facebook Live question um, What was your biggest challenge in bringing the script to life? Oh, Maybe that's both a good of you, question. What was the biggest challenge on this film? We'll open it. That's a good question. Part, that's the biggest more of your challenge. question, I think. Biggest so. challenge. Um, was there a moment where I felt like it just wasn't going to work? Um, yeah, there's always the the yeah. risk of like, is this? Yeah, it's, it's always a pleasant surprise when it comes together into something that you uh, uh, I intended. I remember waiting like you're like, we're going to make it then in the summer, and you're like, the fall. But that's yeah. mostly with film and independent film. Yeah, it's always a challenge, I think, to yeah, to talk people into um, giving you that amount of money to go make your art project. <laughs> um, but I, I, the biggest challenge, um, I don't know, for me, the, personally, the challenge was to make something that was in a genre but still in my own style. And, and for me, I had to think more about uh, a plot and suspense and tension and dialogue and these things that I haven't done as much. And, um, and then you always want to make sure that it's, you know, yeah, it, it can work. I want it to be entertaining and also artful and still in my style. So that, for me, was something to, to figure out. Um, last question is, of course, not a question. It's just someone saying, Colin, marry me. Oh, that's great. <laughs> He's single. Yeah. So, so Annalisa, you know. DM you know. him on Instagram. Or <laughs> that's right. Yeah, that's one. <laughs> He's a very nice guy. He's oh, that's great. I'm glad, that, um, I'm glad that, that he's getting questions like that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm curious about your, your can experience. Um, you know, 
uh, only the second woman in 70 odd years of the Cannes Film Festival to win Best Director. Um, uh, what's it like to take this film? Thank you. Thank you. This, this film feels like it has a risky kind of tone to it. What's, what's, what was it like seeing this the first time with an audience not quite knowing how people are going to res respond? Can can be tough. Yeah, I think it's always scary to show your work, you know, after you put your heart into it and you have to show the world. And, it's, and they can be criti obviously critical and, and tough there, but I think we were just excited about it because we, we just put it together and we were excited to show it. So it was a relief, you know, to be that it went well and, and it was exciting to see it for the first time together, all finished. It was the first time we, I saw it with the sound and the picture both put together and for the actors to see it. So it was exciting. And Cannes is such a, you know, it's, it's, it feels historical when you're there. There's something special and different there. And it also, it's always like the controversial film festival too. Like that's what that film festival is made of. And that, it just feels like the most special way to see a movie in the best theater and the, the whole, you know, theatrics of going up the stairs and having, you know, walking down and then leaving the theater and it's all... It's dramatic, but the it's history very dramatic. of it is... It's history. It, it feels there's like... There's nothing like yeah. it. Yeah, it does have a lot of history and it feels like, you know, all the... It's like a community of filmmakers from all over the world that love cinema and it's... it's yeah, it was exciting to show it there. Yeah. Um, Manola Dargis interviewed you both at, at a can, uh, was a big fan of the film. Um, and Kirsten, I think you told her at that time, you know, Clinton, you know, Clinton and his buddies making a movie, that's something. Now it's Sophia and her buddies making a movie. Um, what's that feel like, Sophia and her buddies making a movie when you're on set? Feels like exactly what I said. <laughs> like, well, you know, it's, I know they had made a few films together as well, Clint Eastwood. Um, and we <laughs> Don Siegel. Yeah, Don Siegel, thank you. Mm. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, whatever, it's not that big of a deal, you guys. Uh, <laughs> we're talking about our movie. Um, but yeah, it just it's always, you know, great to work with Sophia and mm -hmm. I and love that me and you can be compared to Don Siegel and Clint Eastwood in the first place. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, I'd I like that we have a buddy thing. Buddies, buddies, making movies together, that's all there is. Yeah. I, I, love, I mean, how, how much I feel of... like in the same way that I could just be like, Kirsten, this is what we're doing. This is what I want to do. And she says, yes, let's do it, which mm -hmm. is the best for a director to have actors that you love and really trust and be so behind you. And I remember when we made our first movie, like she would do anything if I asked her to try something. And I remember later working with other actors and they were like, well, I'm not sure. And I just, I was like, oh, Kirsten would just like jump in and do whatever because she is gung-ho. And it's a, that's the best thing for, an, you know, to have an actor that really... Uh, gets what you're doing and really is behind you. Yeah. Um, you, know, you know, the stats about the number of women directing films, we've, you know, we've gone through all that. I'm sure both of you have talked about this on a million panels and are, and are slightly tired of that, that conversation. I try to talk to the guys about that as much. But I thought it was really interesting when you were, when it was historic, this, this Best Director win. And it was also interesting to me that, that after you won the award, uh, one of the jury members, Fan Bing Bing, felt the need to say sort of, and we want everyone to understand, she didn't win this because she was a female filmmaker. She deserved this. Oh, that's nice. I didn't realize that. Yeah, I, yeah. I had no idea about the history. And it was you know, it's sad to hear that, um, that there's only been two in all those years. But of course, I'm so proud. And, and it's been nice that everyone's been talking so much about it. And so at least it's brought a lot of conversation. And, and I feel so much like, I know I was walking down the street and, and women would be like, yes, congratulations. And it was such a nice feeling. My kids, my daughters were so proud. They, yeah. My first grader went to school and told her class. And <laughs> so it, it was, yeah, it was really, um, and hopefully now there's going to, you know, Wonder Woman was a hit and, and it's not so exotic to have, to really think about films for a female audience, mm -hmm. right? I was, you know, was going to bring up Wonder Woman in terms of this myth, right, that, that, of that, that mythical story that we see a lot. And there's a mythical feel at the beginning of this movie of the guy who sort of is taken in by a world of women and sort of how that throws everything into question. We've seen it in Star Trek and all kinds of genre shows, sort of old, like I feel like there's that Monty Python scene where um, one, of the, one of the knights refuses to be saved from a castle of women. Um, you know, with that idea, this, this is kind of a mythic story of the, the man finding himself sort of the prisoner of women and the, the eroticism of that and the scariness of that. Was that a myth that you kind of thought about reinterpreting? No, I never thought about that. I just, um, 
the Don Siegel movie is so, yeah, uh, kind of male fantasy turned nightmare. So it was fun to look at the other side of that. But I was, no, I was definitely looking at the, at the, at the female character's point of view. And, yeah. and it was fun to play with that, though. Yeah. Um, and I, I'm curious, like, what are you two doing now? What's, what's next up for both of you? Oh, I think we're, I'm excited that our movie's coming out and yeah. summer vacation. <laughs> <laughs> our movie's coming out. And yeah, that's pretty much it for me as well right now. Lovely. Yeah. Well, uh, next up for us is we're going to keep doing these Screen Times events uh, once a month. And we're so lucky to have the two of you in your film here for Thank our first you. one. We really appreciate it. I didn't it. realize Thank you. it was the first one. Thank you. Thank you, Thank Thank you, you. for coming.